السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على نبيه ومصطفاه سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه ومن ولاه وبعد Dear viewers everywhere Welcome to the 22nd episode of Ask Huda uh, In which we answer your questions Which you deliver to us via the Facebook uh, page and the address once again is www.facebook.com forward slash msalah official. The first question we have today is <coughs> from Ahmed from Ethiopia. His question is, is chewing cot permissible? Uh, cot is a plant uh, similar to tobacco where people actually chew on it. Very common in some parts of the world such as in Yemen, some parts of Africa. And uh, uh, it has some narcotic effect uh, as well. And uh, one of the things which, uh, one of the five necessities which Islam preserves and protects is al-aql. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants a person to be uh, alert, awake, to be aware of what he or she is doing and saying uh, as long as they are in a wakefulness condition, not asleep. Because of that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forbade alcohol and any intoxicant. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Ya ayuha ladina amanu, innama al-khamru wal-maysir wal-ansab wal-azlam wal-rijisum min amal al-shaytani fajitanibuhu la'allakum tuflihun. And he said, innama yuridu al-shaytanu an yuqi'a baynakum al-adawata wal-baghda'a fi al-khamri wal-maysir. Wa yasuddakum an zikri allahi wa an al-salaa fahal antum muntahun. In these two ayat, Allah mentioned number one, the prohibition of alcohol, and by analogy, everything that is intoxicant or will make the mind absent, where the person will feel high or not feeling himself, act or behave differently. And uh, he mentioned the effective cause of the prohibition. What does it because it creates, shaitan creates enmity, hatred, and fights between those who drink, those who smoke, those who administer or take these substances. They become like dependent uh, on these substances. To the extent that you can call it some sort of addiction. وَيَصُدَّكُمْ عَنْ ذِكْرِ اللَّهِ وَعَنِ الصَّلَاةِ And he will hinder you from the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and from the prayer. Many of the scholars are of the view that smoking or chewing cut is absolutely prohibited. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordered us to avoid anything that is haram or whatever leads to haram. So I'm transmitting the opinion of many of uh, the scholars and the muftis in belief that it is not permissible to chew on cut. The second question is from Othman from Holland. He says, if Nike, Nike is a name brand for sportswear, if it represents the Greek goddess of victory, is it permissible to wear it? Well, here's the point. If those who are in charge of this company and the logo and the name brand they put it together and their intent was to represent the goddess of whatever or the god of whatever. Then as a Muslim, one of the requirements of the kalima is number one, negation, nullification, then confirmation. You negate the presence of any god, then you confirm the presence of only one god, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So there is no goddess, no gods. Other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, La ilaha illallah Muhammadun Rasulullah. So La ilaha is a negation. There is no God to be worshipped. Illallah except exclusively Allah alone. 
So we do not believe that there is God for victory and God for defeat and God for rain and God for thunder. This is all the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If it was a coincident, such logo, coin sign, uh, a sign that was used in the ancient Greek civilization as well as in the ancient Egyptian civilizations or whatever, they have too many gods and goddesses. In this case, if it is a coincidence and they do not mean that, then there is no problem because I don't believe so. But if they chose this logo for this reason and they are proud to say that this logo represents uh, the goddess of victory, then as a Muslim, I cannot stand in the prayer or in a match or in a game wherein a sign of the goddess of victory because I'm raising this banner. The Uli banner should be raised as far as the concept of belief is La ilaha illallah. Okay. Um, the next question is from Muhammad Kanti. His question is, is a fasting person intentionally misses a prayer? Is his fasting still valid? He's asking about whether the fasting, al-siyam, is valid or not if a person does not pray. And he said intentionally. There are two opinions pertaining to a person who does not pray. Either he does not pray out of laziness, but he believes in the mandate and the importance of the prayer, this person would not be set free, rather he should be imprisoned by the Muslim ruler or the judge whenever the case of this person is presented before the judge in a Muslim state until he resumes uh, the prayer, until he repents. If he does not, according to Abu Hanifa, they will keep him in prison. The vast majority of the scholars are of the view that if a person does not pray and insists on not praying, even though he believes that the prayer is mandatory, but he does not pray and he insists on not praying, he will be treated like a person who denounces the prayer or does not believe it is mandatory. Why? Because we have several hadith in this regard. Al-Imam Muslim, for instance, collected a hadith in which the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, and the hadith is narrated by Jabir ibn Abdullah, may Allah be pleased with him and his father. He said that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, بين الرجل وبين الكفر والشرك ترك الصلاة. The thin line between a person who is a believer and a non-believer and a disbeliever and those who sit partners to Allah in worship is a prayer. If a person who claims to be Muslim but he chooses not to pray, then he belongs to the other party. He is with the other camp. بين الرجل what stands between Iman and Kufr, Iman and Shirk is a salah Bain al-Rajuli wa bain al-Kufri wa shirki as-salah. Fa man tarakaha faqad kafar. Tarku salah leads abandoning the prayer, not praying, and insisting on not praying leads to Kufr. In another hadith which is collected by Imam Ahmad, uh, An-Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Al-Ahdu alladhi baynana wa baynahum as-salah فَمَنْ تَرَكَهَا فَقَدِ كَفَرْ The difference between the believers and the non-believers is the prayer. So he who does not pray has indeed chose to be a kafir. وَالْعِيَاذُ بِاللَّهِ This is a very well-respected opinion, especially if the person abandoned many, many prayers for many days. So it doesn't make any sense when a person intentionally, deliberately chooses not to pray but he's fasting. We need to ask him a question. Why are you fasting? I'm fasting because Allah says, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu kutiba alaykum usiyamu kama kutiba ala alladheena min qablikum la'allakum tattaqoon. O you who believe fasting is ordained on you as it was prescribed on those who were before you in order to attain taqwa and righteousness. How do you ever attain taqwa while you do not offer the basic faridah of Islam, the main pole of the deen of this tent is as salah If you do not pray, then you should not expect fasting or any other thing to be uh, uh, accepted according to this more right view. A person who does not pray 
and he chooses and insists on not praying, he will be treated according to these hadith as non-Muslim. Uh, also, the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said in one hadith, مَنْ لَمْ يَدَعْ قَوْلَ الزُّورِ وَالْعَمَلَ بِهِ فَلَيْسَ لِلَّهِ حَاجَ فِي أَنْ يَدَعْ طَعَامَهُ وَشَرَابَهُ if somebody who is fasting but still is speaking lies and falsehood, giving a false testimony and acting falsely. So his actions, his sayings are not in the line with the Sharia, with the guidance of the Quran and the Sunnah. He's a liar. And Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, then Allah is not interested in his hunger and thirst. Allah is not in need for him for leaving food and drink and yada'a ta'amahu wa sharaba they go hand in hand as salah is the only ibadah which is not which the person is not exempt from offering as long as he's awake and he comprehends what's going on around him even if the person is lying down on his deathbed he still has to pray salli qa'iman stand up while praying the fault fa illam tastati' فَقَاعِدًا Sit down if you cannot stand up. فَإِنْ لَمْ تستطع فَعَلَى جَنْبٍ Lie down. Even by you moving your eyelid, if this is the best you can do. But no one is exempt from offering the prayer. We know that in the case of fasting, if you're traveling, you're exempt temporarily from fasting. If you're sick, you're exempt temporarily from fasting until you recover. Then you are obliged to make up what you missed of fasting. If you're chronically ill, you do not expect it to recover, then your exempt period from fasting, you just need to feed one poor person per each day of fasting during Ramadan that you skip. But as salah no one is exempt from offering the prayer except, of course, women during their menses. Um, the following question is from CD from Spain. Is it permissible to download the Quran on a mobile phone? Yes, it is indeed permissible. And uh, I highly recommend that every person should have a copy, a soft copy of the Qur'an on their mobile phones. This is different than when you choose the ringtone Qur'anic verses or dhikr. Why? Because I don't recommend that. Because sometimes the phone may go off or start ringing while you are answering the call of nature in the washroom. And this is a place where you're not supposed to be talking. You're not supposed to mention the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And also inside the masjid when the phone starts ringing and it distracts the musallin. So, regular phone ring. But we're talking about smartphones and uploading or uh, uh, downloading on your phones a uh, Quran app. That's perfectly fine. So if you are taking a break between the sessions or lunch break, coffee break, you get a chance to browse a few pages of the Quran. You go to attend the prayer. You pray the sunnah and you sit between the sunnah and the fard, you can find a hard copy of the Quran. Then at least you have a soft one on your mobile phone. You can scroll uh, down the lines, flip the pages, and enjoy uh, having, having an easy access to the Quran to read and memorize, and also the tafsir and the English meaning as well. So that's perfectly fine, CD2. Uh, download the Quran on your mobile phone. The following question is from Arjaf Najm. Arjaf says, Modern science tells us that the universe was created by the Big Bang. Um, I wouldn't say the modern science, rather, this is a theory. And, you know, the, the world was created as a result of an accident or Big Bang. Okay, but is this scientific theory? It have nothing to do with science nor logic. So furthermore, the questioner says, is the Quran in compliance with that? Let's see what the Quran says in this regard. But let me explain the Big Bang Theory. It says that everything was created by accident, including us. The world was created without a creator. So whatever we have today was a result of an accident. And this whole theory and similar theories are intended to make the person not believe in the hereafter and resurrection. Basically, if the person does not recognize the purpose of life because the theory and similar theories tell 
the, the audience or tell the students and those who believe in it that we happen to be here by accident. Uh, it was not intended and the whole world was created due to an accident. So don't worry about it. And here, إِلَّا حَيَاتُنَا الدُّنْيَا نَمُوتُ وَنَحْيَا وَمَا نَحْنُ بِمَبْعُوثِينَ Say, that is the only life that we're going to live. And after we die, there will not be any life, there will not be any resurrection. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in this regard, in ayah number 30 of Surah Al-Anbiya, Surah Al-Anbiya, the prophets, we mention number of prophets. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reasons by logic to prove his presence, his lordship, his oneness, and that he is the only creator, he is the only lord who is worthy of worship. The different types of tawheed. He says in ayah number 30, أَوَلَمْ يَرَ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا أَنَّ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضَ كَانَتَا رَتْقًا فَفَتَقْنَاهُمَا وَجَعَلْنَا مِنَ الْمَاءِ كُلَّ شَيْءٍ حَيْءٍ أَفَلَا يُؤْمِنُونَ This is the logical reasoning in this ayah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, uh, Don't the unbelievers see that the heavens and the earth, the heavens and the earth were actually one thing, one object. فَفَتَقْنَاهُمَا And they were joined together as one unit before. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, We clove them asunder. We split them from each other. And we made the earth to send down the rain and the earth to produce its fruits and vegetations. So there is a relationship between the heavens and the earth and in between there is an air. After they were all one object, one thing. But the difference between this ayah and uh, fake theory is greater than the difference between the East and the West. Because in this ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala proves His Lordship and proves to science, scientists after you exert the effort and you find out finally that the heavens and the earth were one part, were joined together. Allah says, I am the one who split them asunder, who separated them. Furthermore, take this fact. Take this scientific fact. وَجَعَلْنَا مِنَ الْمَاءِ كُلَّ شَيْءٍ حَيٍّ يُؤْمِنُونَ And we created from water every living creature. Subhanallah. مِنَ الْمَاءِ كُلَّ شَيْءٍ حَيٍّ When they believe, then after all, after Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala stated this miracle. So there is a scientific miracle in this ayah, ayah number 30 of Surah Al-Anbiya, definitely, as well as in many other ayat. The Quran is not a book of science, is not a book of math, is not a book of chemistry, but because it is a divine word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it is all miraculous. Every single ayah, and that's why the word ayah means a miracle, by the way, not just a verse. And those who tend to translate uh, this surah consists of 30 verses, such as Surah Tabarak or whatever. I say I would rather use the word ayah because verse does not provide the proper meaning. Each ayah of the Quran is a miracle. This ayah is a miracle. This ayah was revealed to a Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam more than 1400 years ago. And a Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, as you all know that, did not learn reading nor writing. And there Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling him about the matter of the space. He didn't go to space in a space shuttle. He ascended to heaven during the journey of Al-Mi'raj. Allah allowed him to see wonders. And he said to the disbelievers, one day you will find out that they were apart, joined together, and we parted them, and we split them, we clubbed them asunder. This is all by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not as a result of an accident. Furthermore, he gives us some more details about the creation. The creation of the embryo in the womb, now we have a whole science called embryology. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala pointed to that in a few ayahs of the Quran in Surah Al-Hajj, in, 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 uh, in Surah Al-Alaq, Mutfah, Alaqa, Mudra. Amazing, subhanAllah. And the different stages also explained by the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa in the hadith, the exact period, how many days each stage will take. Won't they then believe after all? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Taha, الذي جعل لكم الأرض مهدا وسلك لكم فيها سبلا وأنزل من السماء ماء فأخرجنا به أزواجا من نبات شتى. You want some more? Okay, take this ayah. Allah subhanahu wa taala says, He is the one who has جعل الأرض مهدا. He has made the earth for you 
like a spread, a carpet that spread out, and has enabled you to go about therein by roads, by channels, and has sent down water from the sky. With it, we have produced diverse pairs of plants, fruits, and vegetations. This whole process which takes uh, on on regular basis, which happen on regular basis, definitely not as a result of an accident, but due to an accurate system. And according to the law of cause and effect, there's got to be a creator. If this pen is sitting here, if I leave it here for 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, it won't move by itself unless if somebody push it away. Then I say, there was a cause and there was an effect. If I did not or any person push this pen away, it would move from its place. There has to be a reason. There has to be a founder. There has to be a creator. When we enjoy this technology, the smartphones, iPads, iPhones, and, and uh, the different digital means, we do not say the, 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 the nature created all of that. Of course not. There was an inventor, there was a creator, there was a smart person behind it, and that's why they charge money for it, and we appreciate what they're doing. Okay? We we're not born, we found everything around us like that. So why we believe that everything that we enjoy right now has a manufacturer, while the whole universe, including ourselves, our health, our body components, and our body structure, uh, just happened by accident. That doesn't make any sense. In another ayah in Surah An-Nur, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in ayah number 24, وَاللَّهُ خَلَقَ كُلَّ دَابَّةٍ مِّن مَّا فَمِنْهُمْ مَنْ يَمْشِي عَلَى بَطْنِهِ وَمِنْهُمْ مَنْ يَمْشِي عَلَى رِجْلَيْنِ وَمِنْهُمْ مَنْ يَمْشِي عَلَى أَرْبَعٍ يَخْلُقُ اللَّهُ مَا يَشَاء إِنَّ اللَّهَ عَلَى كُلِّ شَيْءٍ قَدِيرٍ Very beautiful ayah. It is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who created every dabba. Dabba is an animal or living creature that walks, crawls, or glides. Mimma created every animal from water. فَمِنْهُمْ مَنْ يَمْشِي عَلَى بَطْنِهِ Some of these creatures or animals that creep on their bellies. وَمِنْهُمْ مَنْ يَمْشِي عَلَى رِجْلَيْنِ And some of these animals, those which walk on two legs. And some walk on four legs. Allah creates whatever He wills. Inna Allah ala kulli shay'in qadir. The following question is from Brother Qasim. He says, Are Muslims allowed to visit the Dead Sea? He's asking this question because he assumes that the Dead Sea is the location uh, which remained after the destruction of the people of Sadum, the Qariya, the village of Sadum, the people of Lut. When Jibreel السلام, and those who were with him with the angels destroyed the whole village, he carried the whole village, then he turned it upside down, then Allah stoned them with uh, rains of stones, and as a result of that there was a lake uh, or what's called a sea which with black dark water and no living creatures in it. But we cannot confirm that this is the location of the people of Sadum. So since we don't have a solid reference that the Dead Sea is the place which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala destroyed the people of uh, Lut alayhi salam, then we cannot produce a hukm, a ruling of prohibition. And al-aslu fi al-ashya li baha. The original condition is to allow things unless if there is a restriction or a divine legislation that says it is haram. So according to me, we cannot say that visiting or swimming or seeking treatment uh, in, uh, in the water of the Dead Sea is uh, prohibited because we don't have a reference. Mm -hmm. By that, we come to the end of this session. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to teach us what we don't know and help us to act upon what we have learned. Aqulu qawli hadha. وأستغفر الله لي ولكم وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته